without further ado, please allow me to introduce our first speaker, Assistant Professor uh, Yo Ti Ju, who is a Senior Consultant with the Department of Cardiology at the National University Heart Center of Singapore. And he heads the Cardiovascular Prevention and Rehabilitation Unit. He trained in Cardiovascular Prevention and Rehabilitation at the Toronto Rehabilitation Institute from 2014 to 2015 and Sports Cardiology at St. George's University of London from 2015 to 2016. He is the principal investigator for the Singapore Sports Cardiology Registry and is part of the writing committee for the Asian Pacific Society of Cardiology guidelines for pre-participation pre screening in young athletes, as well as the expert advisory committee for the Singapore Physical Activity Guidelines 2022. Um, it is a great pleasure to, uh, to allow uh, System Prof. Yo to talk about uh, his topic on cardiac cardiac deaths in athletes. Prof. Yo, please. Let me start. Okay, a very good afternoon to everyone. I hope you can see my screen and uh, you can hear, hear me as well. Yes, very good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So first, I would like to thank uh, the Singapore uh, uh, Sports Medicine Association of Singapore for this very kind uh, invitation. And uh, also thank everyone for spending Saturday afternoon, uh, you know, listening to this talk. So I, I hope uh, you will find it fruitful. So uh, in a nutshell, what I'll be covering today, I will talk about what is sudden cardiac death uh, in athletes. So as a, in a general uh, scheme first, before going into a little bit more specific uh, involving triathletes as well as the swim leg. I will talk about some of the rationale for screening athletes, the causes of sudden cardiac death. I'll go through some statistics for sudden cardiac death, especially in triathlons. Uh, the role of uh, pre-participation screening and whether we can prevent or mitigate uh, this risk in athletes. So let's start off with, uh, you know, obviously some, some of the media reports. So you can see that uh, there are a, a, a spectrum. So here are just some selected ones that I, I looked at. Uh, the top left actually is not an athlete, but it's a relatively young uh, NS man who actually passed away uh, taking part in the uh, fit exercise session. In the bottom left, uh, you, those who follow football will be uh, familiar with Christian Eriksen's uh, on-field collapse during the Euro 2020. Uh, and then the most recent Dharma Hamlin uh, has been uh, uh, just, just a few weeks ago where he collapsed on field, uh, NFL. So these are all uh, very well publicized events. Uh, of course, more specific to today's talk is uh, the news of this uh, Singaporean passing away during the triathlon held in Portugal. Uh, there has not been any reports talking about the cause of death so far, so uh, we should not speculate, but I will go through in more general terms uh, what we should know about sudden cardiac death in athletes. So going by the um, Wikipedia, uh, it, it actually has a tabulation of triathlon facility, uh, fatalities. Basically, when I was uh, you know, preparing for this talk, I chanced upon the website and it is actually very comprehensive. Somebody actually bothers to uh, you know, take into account all the different fatalities. Um, probably during, uh, these are all reported in the media. So they consolidate them, uh, the country of the race, the name of the, uh, the person who passed away, age, uh, date of race, which triathlon location, and even which event uh, that the, the participant passed away at during. So in Singapore, uh, when you scroll down the uh, triathlon uh, fatalities list, you can actually select country. So in Singapore, these are the uh, very sad uh, fatalities that we have encountered. So uh, 05, 07, 09, 2017, and of course, uh, the, the one that we just saw, but that was in Portugal, not in Singapore. So first and foremost, let's uh, look at the definition of sudden cardiac death or sudden cardiac arrest. So ca sudden cardiac um, death is SCD, sudden cardiac arrest is SCA. So arrest or death that occurs during or up to 24 hours in relation to participation in sport is defined as sudden cardiac arrest or death. Of course, uh, death uh, is irreversible 
but arrest uh, refers to the heart stopping, so there can be recovery from sudden cardiac arrest. This is an infographic from the American uh, College of Cardiology, and uh, there is actually reinforcing the fact that in young athletes, sudden cardiac arrest is the number one cause of death. And there are some symptoms. Not everyone can uh, uh, present in the same way. So the commonest one is just sudden fainting and, and you know being completely unconscious. But a few other symptoms can present, uh, the sudden cardiac arrest or death can present a, with a few other uh, symptoms as well. And if mild, these are actually warning signs. So athletes should be aware of these uh, symptoms. And if it happens uh, more often, or even first time, if it's serious and unexplained, they should get evaluated. Of course, uh, with the sudden cardiac arrest uh, in the media, it, it gives a bit more perspective. So, uh, but it's still important to differentiate between cardiac arrest and heart attack. So cardiac arrest or sudden cardiac arrest is where you know, the heart actually stops beating. So you can see this slide is from Singapore Heart Foundation. So um, it refers to the electrical circuit actually not working well. So the heart is actually uh, uh, not manually pumping the blood uh, to the rest of the body. And this can be because, commonly because of an electrical problem in the heart. And on the other hand, a heart attack is a circulation problem. So this uh, in most uh, you know, easily understood um, terminology is when there is a blockage in the blood vessels of the heart. And often uh, the people who experience heart attacks may have present with chest pain uh, or shortness of breath. Uh, however, if the blockage has been around for a long time and or the muscle has been already deprived of uh, blood circulation for a long time, then the heart may be weakened and a heart attack where the blockage suddenly becomes 100%. You know, for example, uh, the patient may have had you know, progressive narrowing of the blood vessel, but not yet 100%. And then the heart attack is the sentinel event that makes, uh, causes 100% blockage. It in itself can uh, trigger the damaged heart muscle to have uh, abnormal heart rhythms uh, you know, within uh, the heart and cause a cardiac arrest. So although it is uh, uh, interchangeably used, it's not the same, but heart attacks can lead to cardiac arrest. So, you know, this is obviously very important. And is there a way to pick up conditions that can cause sudden cardiac arrest, especially in uh, young and fit athletes, or even young and fit uh, uh, individuals who exercise regularly? So first, let's define uh, athlete because we, that's the, the aim of, of today's talk. So this is actually a, a qualitative definition where somebody who is competitive uh, and when he's he or she trains, there is emphasis on excellence and achievement and they tend to exert to their physical limits. However, as you can see from this picture, the athletes really come in all shapes and sizes. These are Olympic level athletes but none of them, uh, there's no uniformity, you know, depending on their sport, uh, their training and their appearance, uh, all look very, very different. So why screen athletes? So because of their exertion to limits, um, athletes have an almost three times higher risk of sudden cardiac death versus non-athletes. And the incidence is roughly around one is to 50,000 to one is to 15,000. Uh, this is based on uh, database studies and registries. So the picture you see here is, of course, uh, Philippides. He is the first, uh, arguably the first documented sudden cardiac death uh, when he ran from uh, Marathon to Athens to announce Greek victory. But in actual fact, he did not just run 42 km and pass away. He ran upwards of 400 to 500 kilometers over a few days because he was a messenger. But everyone just focused on the final sort of length of his uh, journey. So, of course, um, you know, when we screen, we want to have a benefit to the people being screened. And this uh, landmark paper from Italy uh, provides the evidence for screening. So the blue line you can see on the figure refers to the rate of sudden cardiac death in non-athletes, whereas the red line 
refers to the rates of sudden cardiac death in athletes. And why are they so much higher? It's because uh, in Italy, especially this region where the study was done, the athletes, uh, or rather there's a genetic predisposition of a heart muscle disease called arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. So these, these uh, uh, athletes tended, there were more people having this condition and they actually passed away from abnormal heart rhythms. So by screening, they picked up this condition and disqualified the athletes from, exercise, uh, from participating in competitive sport. And with uh, initiation of this compulsory screening, they managed to reduce the incidence of sudden cardiac death by almost 90%. This is very, very impressive and provided a strong uh, evidence for um, you know, mandatory screening, especially in Italy. But uh, not everywhere in the world uh, has the same um, prevalence or incidence of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. These are some of the temporal and geographical and even age-related trends in uh, sudden cardiac death. So there are many different causes. In the past, the rest of the world, uh, commonest cause was something called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where the heart muscle is abnormally thick and could cause either, uh, you know, block physical obstruction to the blood flow out of the heart, and then thus causing sudden cardiac death, or abnormal heart rhythms uh, going through the abnormally thick muscle. But these days, there is this condition that is the most common, it's called sudden arrhythmic death syndrome. So that forms the majority where um, athletes or individuals who pass away are uh, found to have a structurally normal heart. So apart from all these, uh, if we look closer into the age uh, this, you know, category, so for younger athletes, and by young we mean less than 35 years old, uh, these are the common uh, causes for sudden cardiac death. So something structural, the heart muscle or the valve have problems. So hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, rhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, something wrong with the coronary arteries, they come out in the wrong area. Uh, something where the soft tissue, connective tissue have problems, the Marfan syndrome, the valves or uh, aortic valve and mitral valve having issues. There can be an electrical problem. So the heart muscle, the structure is perfectly normal, but there's uh, abnormalities in how the electricity passes through the heart. So Bugada syndrome, long QT syndrome, and of course the acquired uh, cardiac abnormalities. So acquired means uh, not inborn, not born with it. Uh, so infections, trauma. So this uh, commotion cordis has again uh, taken the spotlight recently. I will elaborate a bit more uh, later on. Of course, uh, some people do take performance enhancing drugs that can cause problems. And of course, hypo and hyperthermia. Hypothermia being uh, more relevant, I would suppose, uh, when it comes to triathlon and open water swimming. Now, there's a lot of uh, causes of sudden cardiac arrest or death in the young athletes. But once you go past 35 years old, the vast majority of sudden cardiac death actually is from uh, the plain old atherosclerosis or development of uh, obstructive plaques within the coronary arteries. So you see here this uh, uh, light yellow portion. So vast majority of uh, deaths actually are due to atherosclerosis in the older athletes. So this is uh, uh, a, publish, a publication from uh, the group from Changi led by Dr. Tong Kim Ling. So uh, they looked at the number of deaths related uh, to sporting activity from 20, uh, 2005 to 2015. And it again reflects that ischemic heart disease is the most common cause of sudden cardiac death, whether you are taking part in competitive or non-competitive sport, uh, whether you are below or even, uh, whether you are above 35 or even below 35, uh, the majority is actually uh, ischemic heart disease. Now, uh, moving into more specific data for triathletes. So this paper uh, looks at uh, wide um, uh, time duration, 1985 to 2016, uh, death and cardiac arrest in US triathlon participants. So there were almost, I think, a million uh, participants. And from that one million, they found that uh, 135 uh, deaths, or rather cardiac arrest, uh, deaths of 120, and then 113 survived. So I draw your attention to this red box. So triathletes uh, over the years, the mean age was in the mid 40s. Uh, 
those who survive tend to be a bit younger and uh, the males tend to be a bit older than the females. You can see that the race segment that most commonly had the sudden cardiac arrest was indeed the swim leg, 67% uh, compared to the bike run and even post race. The race length, um, <clears throat> sprint distance seems to be uh, more likely to have such events. Uh, and, but not the majority was not actually, uh, of the participants did not actually uh, take part in the first triathlon, so they would have been a repeated participant already. And in fact, uh, in terms of the body of water of the death, the majority is actually a lake or reservoir. So um, sim uh, the, from this paper, they looked at uh, those who had autopsy. So of the 120 something deaths, only half of them went through autopsy. And of the uh, autopsy findings, the, again, the majority is from heart disease as, a, as the cause of death. Uh, of these heart diseases, atherosclerosis was the commonest. There were five that passed away from non-heart related issues and 29 out of 31 had no definitive cause of death. So then comparing this to some other registry and statistics, especially uh, in terms of marathon or long distance running. So you can see that this paper here came at all. If you haven't read this before, it's a racer study. They look at 2 million participants of endurance races, including half marathons. So the incidence of uh, or risk of death was, was stated as one, uh, whereas for triathlons, the incidence is higher. And I suppose it's because of a few things. Number one is the different components, especially the swim leg. And number two, the mean age appears to be a little bit older uh, than those taking part in the marathons. And when you're older, obviously your risk of atherosclerosis will be higher. So this is the RACER study in, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, so uh, important thing to note is that uh, for marathon running, most of the cardiac arrest happened at the last quarter, just before the finish line. Okay, and multifactorial, apart from cardiac pathology, there were also other things that contributed to these arrests. And uh, in 10.9 million runners, there were 59 cardiac arrests over 10 years. So, significantly lesser than the triathletes. Some potential uh, conditions that are related to or potentially can be tri triggered by uh, swimming will be something like this. This is the long QT syndrome. So draw your attention to the top left-hand corner. There is the long QT syndrome type number one. It's actually the most common of the different types. There are three types, one, two, and three. So uh, more than one third of the long QT syndrome is type one. And these people tend to have their abnormal rhythms triggered by um, sudden immersion in water. For instance, swimming, especially cold water. So you see over here, 68% this red bar. Uh, these are the triggers for this uh, um, abnormal rhythm of ventricular fibrillation. So sudden death can be caused like that. Uh, the other types, uh, especially type 2, are triggered by loud sounds and emotion. So, so long QT syndrome can potentially be picked up uh, relatively easily by just a screening and resting ECG. So you can see that uh, for those who are familiar with the ECG, this is the P wave, the QRS complex, and the T wave. So typically the T wave comes out just after the QRS complex and doesn't uh, come up so far off. So in all three situations, if you look, if you draw a, a, mid, a line between the two uh, spikes or the RR interval, the T wave should not be anywhere close to the midline. But uh, in all three situations, you can see that they have already crossed the midline. So that uh, you can actually identify using a screening ECG. And these uh, conditions are potentially easily treated. So once you find out the type, uh, do a further genetic testing or you know, evaluate their risk, they can potentially be managed with medication uh, and uh, um, you know, risk stratification for exercise as well. For example, they may have to avoid swimming, but they could still participate in other non-water-based sports. Now, uh, commercial cordis, uh, with the recent um, collapse in the NFL, 
the Dama Hamlin uh, case, this has come into spotlight. But I wish to um, emphasize that there has not been any uh, official release of the cause of his collapse. And uh, it's very easy to assume that, you know, because he was tackled and he fell, fell down and after that he collapsed soon after standing up, that it is due to a projectile effect uh, or commercial cordis. But um, I think a lot of uh, experts, especially those in the US, the sports cardiology experts, uh, uh, caution that we should not assume until, uh, you know, official uh, information has been released. It could be many other things and not just commercial cordis because as you can see from the figure, commercial cordis often happens in the very young teenagers or even younger. You can see from the picture. And the, uh, it is to a very, very specific uh, projectile hit to a specific part of the heart at a specific angle and a very, very specific time. So 20 milliseconds. And that's very, very short. So in order for abnormal heart rhythm called ventricular fibrillation to develop, the projectile has to have enough force and hit the heart at a specific enough time to screw up the electrical conduction in the heart to develop this rhythm. And often the triggers are the hockey puck, lacrosse ball, baseball, less so uh, a shoulder charge, especially when you have shoulder pads already. So in fact, some people are saying that it's actually not commercial cordis that uh, has affected um, Dama Hamlin. Whether this can affect uh, open water swims when there's a lot of uh, paddling, kicking, uh, you know, in, in the water, um, this one is uh, cause, you know, it can be debated. But of those documented causes, I think um, uh, that is from commercial causes in the water, I don't think there are any at this point in time. So we move on to uh, uh, swim, uh, screening again. So for those uh, who deal with athletes or would like to have, uh, you know, more reassurance before participation in sport, uh, the pre-participation screening is very useful. Uh, it's often composed of a history uh, and, and, and questionnaire on certain symptoms that may be sinister and warrant further evaluation. So unexplained fainting, uh, unexplained drop in fitness, becoming very breathless, uh, fast heartbeat, so on and so forth. These uh, warrant further investigation. A physical examination can be done as well to listen out for abnormal heart sounds, uh, for abnormal pulses, for instance. And then in certain cases, depending on situation, a resting 12 lead ECG is performed. The ECG is quite controversial, although it is very useful to pick up certain conditions like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We went through the long QT syndrome earlier on. ARVC, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, you can also use that. Brugada syndrome, but there are still many, many conditions that uh, the ECG cannot pick up. The ECG cannot pick up blockages. So, uh, you know, if you have chest pain because of blockages, the ECG will not come in useful. If it is a abnormal um, blood vessel that's uh, coming out of the um, big blood vessel of the heart, the aorta, or anomalous coronary arteries, the ECG will not pick it up as well. So, you know, the the US especially are very sensitive to this and they do not recommend universal ECGs for screening. That is because uh, they also feel that um, interpretation of the ECG is very important. Somebody that has to be trained uh, that uh, knows what ECG findings in athletes will look like before screening can be done. And um, what is the prevalence of disease that can be picked up with ECG in the population you want to screen? If it is in the very general population, you have to screen many, many people before you pick up one or two, uh, you know, life-threatening problems. Whereas uh, if you are targeted and screen very, very specific, very high-level athletes, the pickup rate may be higher and uh, more resource saving. So for those who deal with ECGs, this is the most uh, recent or the latest uh, evidence-based guidelines that uh, is recommended for screening. This is the international recommendations. Uh, uses a traffic light format, green, yellow, and red, to identify what are the normal findings from ECG related to training, as well as uh, some of the abnormal findings that will never uh, be due to training, and some borderline findings. So depending on what you find on the ECG, you can either clear the, the athlete or do further testing. 
Uh, the only downside is that there is no Asian data so far, and it's all Caucasian, black and white as it's based. So as a result, um, a group of us uh, formed the, a, a consensus uh, recommendation for the pre-participation screening in uh, young competitive athletes. So uh, in the interest of time, I will skip those. So what we did was we modified the uh, US categorization of sport. So here you see a three by three table. And on the x-axis, the it shows the dynamic component. So, so how much uh, how much cardio there is now, the aerobic component, and on the y-axis, how much strength or static component the sport comprises. So you see that there are red boxes. The red boxes refer to uh, a new additions compared to the American classification, and most of them are actually Asian related. And triathlon, you can see, is over here, top right-hand corner the highest dynamic plus highest static components. Uh, so truly, a, a, you know, maximum kind of exertional endurance sport. And further uh, categorization into a low, moderate and high intensity uh, sport categories. So the Asia Pacific consensus statement actually recommends that young competitive athletes below 35 should go for history and physical examination as pre-participation screening. Uh, for the ECG, we do recommend it, but only when all of the uh, following are fulfilled. So whoever is screening has the capacity for mass ECG screening. We don't want to overload the system. Number two, the ECG should be performed to an acceptable standard. So the stickers have to be placed in the correct position. Uh, the print out, the lines, uh, the, the machines have to be uh, accredited. And finally, the ECG should be interpreted by somebody trained to do so. And um, if there are any abnormal elements in the history, abnormal findings on the physical examination, or something that warrants referral in the ECG based on the international recommendations, then the athlete should be referred to somebody who is qualified to evaluate. For master athletes and those participating in low intensity sport, the consensus group uh, did not recommend routine pre-participation screening. Uh, otherwise, you know, the floodgates will be open and, and uh, systems may be swarmed. But of course, uh, given that in the triathlon group, uh, most of the people participating tend to be on the master category, uh, plus it is very taxing on the body. If you know of uh, people taking part in triathlons and you have the capacity or, or for screening, then you should uh, recommend your uh, these people, participants, to go for screening. Uh, there is a whole set of other pre-existing heart diseases that we can go into, but not in this setting. So uh, just now, all that we've mentioned is for people who are not known to have pre-existing heart problems. Once you have pre-existing heart problems like heart muscle disease, previous infections before, uh, previous blockages before, or heart attacks before, abnormal heart rhythms, abnormal electrical rhythms, then there's a whole set of guidelines, uh, various guidelines available for reference. And these are usually uh, uh, from the, the more, the more recent ones are from the Europeans and the Italians. So by and large, uh, the workflow for most athletes would be to evaluate the sport, and uh, um, the age, the gender, and consider further evaluation to risk stratify, depending on the, whether the patient has, uh, or whether the athlete has any pre-existing problems or not, or any symptoms or not. And there are a variety of tests that can be done to evaluate the heart. After that, shared decision-making is done. So it's not just a one-shot, oh, you have this condition, uh, you are banned from sport. No, it's not like that nowadays. We have to evaluate with the athlete, the coach, the family, and the physician before making a final decision. We'll speed up a little bit. Okay, so after all that, again, nothing is impossible. So you see that Christian Erickson is a true success story. He's playing with an implanted defibrillator uh, after his collapse uh, at the top level. And um, so in the past, those with uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, I'm not sure whether that is what Christian Erickson has, but this is just a uh, a guide, a reference to, to illustrate the point. So in the past, people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy could not uh, exercise competitively, so they would be disqualified straight away. 
but uh, over the years, I think uh, there's been a, li a lot more leeway and certain uh, recommendations or concessions can be made. And uh, even if you have uh, some symptoms, you can modulate the exercise accordingly. This one we went through earlier. Now, we've talked a lot about what happens before in terms of screening, in terms of uh, uh, risk stratification, but we should also focus on after. Let's say a collapse does happen. That is actually equally, if not more important. So this, uh, I like to use to illustrate this point. In Japan, the marathon runs are actually covered by safety individuals who have mobile defibrillators. So they are, they are riding bicycles with a backpack containing AED. So they are able to reach uh, potential collapses very, very fast. So, you know, in 2005 to 2017, all the road races from 10 to marathon level uh, were looked at, and there were about one and a half uh, sudden cardiac arrests per 100,000 runners. All of them uh, actually were saved. And the median interval between the collapse and the shock, not the collapse and first CPR, the collapse and the shock was two minutes. So that's extremely impressive. Uh, the interval between collapse and initiation of CPR is less than a minute. So I, I don't know whether it's only Japan that can do this, but you know you see that prompt uh, recognition of uh, collapse and prompt resuscitation with early defibrillation can save many lives. There's 100% return of circulation and 100% favorable outcome up to one year. And these people only stay in the hospital five days. Imagine you actually had a, a heart stop. You only stay in hospital five days and you're discharged favorably. Uh, last, two, last few slides, mitigating risk of sudden cardiac death. I think the other two speakers will probably touch more on that. But I think from my point of view, from the cardiology point of view, it is early recognition, early CPR, early defibrillation. Um, and potentially this elimination of mass starts will allow more um, attention on the existing uh, batches of uh, uh, triathletes. Um, of course, if you deal with people with heart disease, then uh, you need to um, counsel your athletes that, uh, you know, whether they, even if they don't have heart, heart disease, they should not race when they are ill, take, uh, take into consideration the environmental factors, uh, always uh, refuel because, you know, there are a lot of electrolyte problems when you race. If you're on medication, please do not stop. Uh, medication, uh, your medication, resist the temptation to sprint close to the finish line because that's where the most problems occur and listen to the body. Don't push through if something doesn't feel right. Okay, and uh, this is finally uh, one of my cardiac rehab patients who had uh, blockages, uh, atherosclerosis. He underwent uh, ballooning and stenting, PCI, and underwent cardiac rehabilitation. And this is his uh, uh, event after um, he completed cardiac rehab, two years post rehab. So anything is possible and then the sky is the limit. So yeah, I think I will, interest of time, I'll skip the conclusion. I'll save the questions for later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof. Yol, for the talk. Um, shall move ahead uh, with the next program. Um, let me invite uh, Mr. Willie Lu uh, on next. Um, Billy, are you there? All right. Yep, I'm here. Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. So, uh, Willie began his staff affair with triathlon in the early uh, 2000s as a member of the National Triathlon Squad. He took a break from short course racing to focus on half Ironman distance triathlons before returning to the national team. So, Willie represented Singapore at the 2015 and 2017 and 2019 Sea Games, winning the bronze medal in 2015. So with almost two decades of triathlon experience, Willie is also a passionate coach that has worked with athletes of all abilities, racing both short and long course triathlon. Most recently, he guided the Vietnamese triathlon team to their first gold medal at the 2021 Sea Games. Without further ado, let me introduce uh, Mr. Willie Lu. Willie, please. Thank you, Joshua. I uh, also want to uh, thank uh, the SNAS for the opportunity to speak to all of you today. Uh, open water swimming, uh, and especially triathlons, uh, is a topic that's really close to my heart, So, uh, but I'll try to keep it uh, as brief as possible, but as, uh, I've been known to ramble on a lot. Uh, so Joshua has uh, already given me a very nice introduction. Uh, so I did start triathlon um, uh, 20 years ago, um, just after NS. I had a friend who was 
uh, in the national team at the time. Uh, we used to swim together when we were a lot younger, and that's where my background is. I, I was a competitive swimmer in primary school, um, and then I moved on to water polo uh, all the way up to the time I was in national service. And then after that, uh, I really started to get into triathlon and uh, to learn a bit more about training and uh, coaching and what goes into it when I was uh, studying in Australia. Uh, that was my first chance to be exposed to a lot of uh, higher level athletes, which are uh, in Singapore because the sport's relatively new, we don't really get a, uh, a big opportunity to do so. Uh, so yeah, so um, besides that, um, right now I am moving, I guess, a little bit more away from uh, competitive uh, triathlon. Uh, I'll still compete uh, in the next few years, but less for the national team and a, a bit more just as a age grouper, uh, which is really where the the bulk of triathlon participants are from. All right, so uh, just in this next slide, so one of the biggest pro um, hindrances or biggest um, barriers to entry for people joining triathlon has often been swim. If you don't grow up um, as a swimmer from a young age, it is a difficult sport to pick up just because swimming is such a, uh, it's a really unnatural movement. It's not something that while you had a lot of books, you know, like Born to Run and everyone tells you that humans are born to move, swimming is uh, something that requires a lot of repetition. It's probably one of the, the only sports out of swimming, cycling, and running where technique is uh, there is a much higher priority on technique. It's the one sport where being very strong or being uh, very fit doesn't necessarily guarantee that you're going to be very fast or very good at it. So this is, uh, in the past, a lot of triathlons used to have what you see here on screen. This is the mass start from Ironman Hawaii, which is actually the uh, World Championships. What it used to be was that everybody who is supposed to start in a particular rate, in a particular wave, uh, upwards of two or 300 people, everyone jumps into the water and you wait and you tread water. It could be for five or 10 minutes. And then when the horn goes, everybody uh, just starts off. What they have sort of transitioned to, I think also in response to some of the uh, fatalities that we've had in triathlon over the years, is that they have now moved to a self-feeded uh, rolling start. Um, in this picture, you see the, there's still quite a lot of them, and these are actually uh, the professionals who are taking part. So they will still start in a, a mass start event, but behind you, uh, behind that, you see there are gantries that have been set up, and behind that, all the age groupers. So anybody who is not uh, racing for money, everyone you are, well, you are asked to be honest, about your swimming ability and when you register, they will generally ask you in a questionnaire how fast you think you're going to be able to complete uh, the swim leg. And then on the morning itself, it's up to you to walk into the correct tent. So if you, for some reason, want to swim with a friend who's a really strong swimmer and you are maybe not, not as confident as he is, if you are wearing the same colored cap, you can actually just sneak into the, uh, to the front wave as well. So a lot of this comes down to um, self-assessment. You have to be very aware of your own ability and really how confident you are in getting into the water. All right, so uh, today we're just going to go through um, some of the challenges. Um, they will be some related to race conditions. Uh, some of them are natural conditions. Um, and then also, especially uh, what I will discuss is how we tackle that living here in Singapore where we don't have as much access to open water as a lot of uh, other countries. And uh, but to finish off, I'll just run through a pre-race routine which we try to encourage uh, athletes to, to have, especially when it comes to um, those of them who may be a bit apprehensive about going into open water. Okay, so one of the main draws of triathlon um, nowadays, uh, triathlon overall is one of the fastest growing sports uh, in the world. Uh, largely, it's been driven by um, the Ironman Corporation. So Ironman is synonymous with a uh, long distance triathlon. And for a very long time, they were the only ones who were uh, recognized as um, um, they had the only recognized world championship for long distance triathlon. And so uh, 
In a full Ironman, you're expected to swim 3.8 kilometers. They will bike 180 kilometers and then they finish off with a run of 42 kilometers. So just a marathon to finish off. The cutoff timing for a full Ironman for the last participant is usually 17 or 17 and a half hours. The professional athletes, the professional men are starting to finish the races now in under eight hours quite regularly. Um, so for a lot of the age groupers, uh, this is anyone who has picked up triathlon uh, as a hobby and has uh, decided to go all in and they want to challenge themselves to the longest format that is available. The 3.8 kilometer swim is, if you look at a day where you expect to spend um, anywhere between 10 to 15 hours on average on the race course, um, spending one to one and a half hours of time in the water is uh, probably proportionally small. And so what you see with a lot of athletes who join um, these races is that they also then don't put, don't put in as much training into uh, the swim portion. So a lot of them prefer to spend time cycling or running where, I mean, uh, if you're honest, you, know, you really spend the most time there. So to, to a lot of us, when it comes to the swim, the, it's, a, it's a matter of uh, decreasing uh, return for the amount of time that you put into the swim. Uh, but later on, um, when I, before I finish up, I will discuss how I'm trying to, that's one of the, the mindsets that I think a lot of us as uh, participants and as coaches, we should try and change. All right, so with a lot of the ocean conditions that we face in open water swimming, this is one of the, I think this is one of the biggest disadvantages that athletes from Singapore uh, are faced with. When it comes to open water swimming, we have two options in Singapore. You either swim in East Coast or you swim at Sentosa. So East Coast Park is uh, open to the shipping line. There is not a lot of clean water. There are all sorts of things floating around. Uh, it's a far more challenging swim, but because there are also no lifeguards on duty, it is, uh, it is a bit challenging to organize any sort of um, meaningful training uh, at East Coast Park. So a lot of us will then head to Sentosa, where we can swim either at Tanjong or Palawan beaches. Uh, at both those beaches, there's a roped up area where you can swim um, up three to 400 meters nonstop. So this presents the best location that if you really wanted to spend some time in the water as a, a Singapore-based athlete, this is where you're going to have to do it. Uh, but even then, we are one of the things that you never ever deal with is big waves and we don't have a huge current. Once in a while, you may get the, the odd shipping container that, that goes by and uh, you have a few waves for maybe one or two minutes. But otherwise, when you, for anyone who has raced maybe in Australia or New Zealand, there are some swell conditions that we are fairly ill-equipped Ill to deal with. Right, so besides the, the current and the waves, one of the uh, big problems that, uh, that I find personally as, a, as an athlete who has grown up in Singapore is that um, I do not do well in cold water. Right? So a lot of races where uh, in uh, Europe or in America, a lot of the triathlons will allow you to wear a wetsuit only if the water temperature falls below 24 degrees. So anything below 16 degrees is, uh, is mandatory, but Anything under 24, you have the uh, you have an option whether or not you want to use it. So most triathletes will jump at the chance to wear a wetsuit. Um, wetsuits increase your buoyancy, um, and also with a if you are a weaker swimmer, it is a, it really helps. All you need to do is really move your arms. You don't really have to worry so much about your leg sinking. Um, body positioning so will help greatly. But uh, the downside of that is that because we don't spend a lot of time in the wetsuit, it can be very restrictive. Some people will only wear the wetsuit a couple of days before they go for the race, and then they find that it's suddenly, uh, they're not used to it, they feel very uncomfortable. Um, the neckline goes very, very high to prevent water from going in. So if you already have some anxiety, uh, being stuck in a rubber suit for uh, 90 minutes may not, uh, may not help. All right, so, and, uh, some of the other things that we deal with, of course, you know, just the position of the sun, you know, um, being able to see where we're going. 
these are all things which will, will present themselves in uh, every race. Um, there are ways that we train ourselves to deal with these uh, issues in Singapore, and uh, we do a lot of that in the swimming pool. So it can be done, um, but really a lot of it is uh, just a, a desire to want to spend time focusing on how to how to overcome some of these challenges. So another problem um, that we face going into open water is uh, oh, so this uh, this I'll take speed from a personal experience. Even though I've done quite a few races, uh, I'm fairly terrified of uh, what I will run into in the ocean. So anything from fish to jellyfish, of course, you know you watch enough. Um, National Geographic, you always worry about sharks. Um, so, but growing up in Singapore, when you swim, if, if any of you have been into East Coast, we do not exactly have a great visibility. Most of the time, it's uh, one to two meters. Um, so, you don't, I don't, I've never had to worry about being able to see very much. But uh, the moment you travel overseas, uh, you know, Philippines, uh, in Australia, Water quality is uh, it's amazing. You know, you can see all the way to the sea bed sometimes, and sometimes the uh, the more you see, the the worse it is. For for me, I usually have to do what I'll do is uh, I'll get into the water if I can um, before the start of the race, just to get over being surprised by how much you can actually see underwater. So it is a uh, it is one of those things that you can uh, overcome if you are prepared to. You know, you really just have to. Um, calm yourself down and really the chances of I won't say that the chances are, are zero but you know, not, most of the time nothing is going to happen to you the, the most um, I think the, the most common occurrence of any um, incident with sea life is that some of the some of the swimmers do get stung by jellyfish uh, it is uncomfortable it's, uh, it can be quite painful but most of the time it is something that you uh, that most of us uh, live, live, uh, live through um, the other thing that I think that presents the biggest challenge for being on the ocean is that um, a lot of times when you get tired, you know, it's, whether it is 1.9 kilometers or you're swimming a full 38, uh, 3.8 kilometers, or even for the athletes to do a sprint triathlon, which is only 750 meters of swimming, when you get tired there, you know, where do you rest? You know, I think if you are swimming, uh, if you are cycling or if you are running and, you know, you hit the wall, you suddenly feel really tired, you can always just get off your bike or you just sit down by the side of the road. But for a lot of swimmers, I think they start to panic when they, when they start to feel that maybe they're reaching the end of their fitness and their endurance is running out and they are not prepared for um, the situation for what, uh, if, they, if they are unable to carry on, what should they do? So one of the most important things I think that if you are going to take part in a, a triathlon that involves an open water swim, is that you have to be able to at least tread water. Uh, all of us need to have a safety stroke, whether it is a lot of us will do breaststroke. Some of us will flip over onto our backs to do some, uh, just some backstroke. And what is that? You just want to have a, a backup plan, you know, something that will allow you to, in the event that you are suddenly very anxious, you know, maybe some, something has happened in the water and you are starting to panic a little bit, you need to be able to slow things down and to just uh, maybe just swim away from where everybody else is and just catch your breath uh, before you, you carry on. So um, this is one of those things where I think a lot of us are aware of the danger of swimming in open water, but very few of us will want to face head on to say, okay, I also then need to do some actual preparation um, to get myself ready in the event that this happens. So preparation is, is key. So a lot of this you, um, training that you do outside of the races uh, throughout the rest of the year, you know, those, things, those things that you do during training, those things become very important. It gives you the confidence to deal with uh, some of the challenges that you'll face uh, over water. Uh, so if you talk about the actual conditions that you face during, uh, during the race, I think these are the things which... Uh, that don't pre that are not so I would say they are I would say they are not uh, not dangerous but there are things that we can definitely overcome. Uh, so things like navigation. Navigation is the, the biggest thing that you if you are already concerned about uh, open water swimming, the last thing you want to do is to be swimming off course and to then have to swim extra. You know, so 
the other thing also is that most of the time, even if you train in a swimming pool, uh, if you are in a pool and it's crowded, there may be two or three people that you might have to share a lane with. But in a really big event, if you go to one of the more popular triathlons, uh, like even the, the 70.3 in uh, Vietnam, that race has in excess of 1,500 participants, even with a rolling start uh, where they release five swimmers, uh, five athletes every five seconds. After everyone hits the water, you know, it's just uh, in that first two or 300 meters, everybody is there. You're uh, easily surrounded by 30 or 40 swimmers every single time. So that is what they uh, have often referred to as the, the washing machine effect, where if you jump into the water and everyone is same as you, you know, the adrenaline is pumping, you're ready to go. Once you dive into the water, all you see is arms and legs crashing about, and it's just bubbles under the water. You can't see anything. Um, the chance of getting hit in the face is uh, fairly high. And so these are the these conditions are going to be present at every race. I mean, there is a very little chance of you joining a race that is uh, and then jumping in the water and having clear water all around you. So to reduce any sort of panic, any sort of uh, anxiety, you, know, you really have to do a lot of training to be prepared so they can really mitigate a lot of these uh, situations. So I think the, uh, even though uh, just now uh, in the previous presentation, we did say, we did hear that the, uh, we actually found that a lot of the experienced athletes were the ones who were um, suffering from uh, uh, sudden cardiac death in a triathlon. I think that also, you know, it, it is a function of these athletes being uh, swimming at a much higher um, effort than a lot of uh, the rest of us as the age groupers. For a lot of the professionals, you find that they are often swimming just under um, their threshold, just under the red line. You know, they are trying to straddle that line between um, being able to push themselves as hard as they can and still being able to uh, to know that they still need to race for another six or seven hours you know, after they get out. So it, if it can happen to a very experienced, very strong swimmer, you know, it can happen to all of us. So the, the thing is that when you are, things happen very quickly uh, in open water, all you need is you know, for someone to maybe not have, more, everyone else has a, most of the time there's no malicious intent, you know, but there's a, lot of, there's a lot of physical contact in the swim. You might uh, accidentally touch somebody on the leg and that swimmer may be as anxious as you are. And so what they'll do is they'll bring a leg up and they'll suddenly do a big breaststroke kick. Uh, they hit you in the stomach or the chest by, by accident or someone will throw an elbow and it'll hit you in the face. All you need is one of these things and suddenly, you know, uh, your goggles fill up with water. There is a, you know, you can't breathe properly, you swallow a bit of water as well. So things happen very fast and especially with the, the new athletes and the weaker swimmers really need to pay attention to this and you really have to be committed to putting in the training that will allow you to deal with these sort of uh, incidents when they happen. So uh, the main things we see for swimmers, uh, for triathletes who are struggling with the swim, you know, it's usually uh, it's poor technique. Uh, as I covered earlier, that swimming is really technique based. Um, it's not the sort of thing that you you can really learn on your own from watching a couple of videos on YouTube. Um, the other thing is that it's also that it's a uh, these swimmer, these uh, actually suffer from poor swim fitness. Um, the ocean is a real unnatural place to be in. You know, it's a, a lot of times it's a, probably the one place that you feel really uh, out of your element. You, you don't have a lot of control over what's happening. Uh, and also with the influx of uh, adults who have come to triathlon, um, as we said, the, the one of the largest age groups for triathlon in almost any race is the 40 to 49 age group. Uh, this is a group where suddenly everyone is, uh, I won't say midlife crisis, but you know, they are looking for something else to challenge themselves with. They may have gone through a whole list of other sports. They do have a little bit more time to get engaged in, in a sport. And triathlon is one of those sports that because of its community and because of the, how you can race in very exotic locations, it's very attractive to a lot of people to pick up. And of course, the the challenge itself makes it a, a, a real, um, uh, has played a, a large part in its increasing popularity, but because of the demographic of people who have started to come to the sport, who are not, who know how to swim, but have maybe never had any formal swim training, 
that late that late exposure does put you at a disadvantage. And it is I, I know I, I keep I keep harping on this, but it's one of those swimming is one of those things that people um, all assume that they can do, but have never been trained for. And when it comes to triathlon, they don't see the value of putting in um, you know, three or four hours of swim training a week if they have a real limited amount of time that they can swim for them. A lot of a lot of the athletes view the swim as just something that they need to get through just so they can get onto the bicycle, just so they can get onto the run. And, and for them, that is where the that is where the um, the, the run, the, the race is really starting for them. Right, so as a coach uh, and uh, as someone who has been racing for, for quite a while, you know, I've I've had to find ways to be prepared for um, open water conditions while living in Singapore. You know, um, I don't spend a lot of time going to Sentosa. While things is just in, in, in the interest of time, it's, it's a lot easier to get to a swimming pool than it is to, to try and find a way to, to open water. And I think a lot of athletes are faced with that, um, that situation as well. So a lot of things that we can do, we do in the, in the swimming pool. So we, we work on our technique, the other thing that we always focus on will be to improve our strength and, and endurance, which is paramount, especially in uh, some of the longer events. And some of the and then the other things that we do is we we have to we have to work on a lot of skills. Um, these are the skills which will allow us to um, to really tackle the um, the challenges and the conditions that we are faced in, in a lot of the races. Uh, so I don't want to get into too much uh, technical detail, but uh, just so that uh, everyone everyone knows what to look out for uh, when you if you decide if any of you decide to to uh, join a triathlon if you haven't already. Um, when it comes to swim technique, whether it's in the pool or open water, the things that we always focus on is uh, body positioning. So we want to be uh, flat, you know, close to the surface of the water. Um, the kick is not. Uh, super essential, especially for most of us. If you're not going for a lot of speed, if you're not trying to break a, some record, use the kick simply for buoyancy and for balance. Uh, focus on your positioning instead. And then, of course, the, the main thing is going to be that, that it comes down to having a, having a real steady rhythm with your breathing. A lot of times you'll find that if you are the sort who of it with with swimmers who are not confident in water, you can usually tell because every time they turn to breathe, what they'll do is they'll take in a very huge amount of air and then they'll keep it in their lungs. And then what they'll do is they will exhale just before they turn to take their next breath. So what happens is that when they breathe in too much and you're holding so much air in your lungs, it pushes the, the, your chest cavity upwards. And these swimmers who are already struggling with body positioning, what happens then is that pushes the legs down. So in their attempt to try to get as much breath as they can, they have already sacrificed their body positioning and then that leads to it being harder for them to breathe and then it, they start to take even bigger breaths. So after that, it's this cycle which really starts to lead you to, uh, you know, they start to spiral downwards and then after that, that's when you find that they have to, they have to stop doing freestyle and they have to come up a breaststroke. And it really, if, if this happens to you in the middle of the race, you know, it's, it's really something that is a, it's a real big blow to your confidence. So these things you want to be able to practice and be very confident doing in the swimming pool so that when we then transition into open water, you know, it, it, it takes a little bit of adjustment. But in any event, we always have a um, strong foundation and strong basics that we can always fall back on. So it is not the most scientific uh, way of preparing for an event, but what a lot of uh, athletes will do is to then do an over distance approach to their swim. So if your race is, if you're doing a, an Ironman, for example, and you have to swim 3.8 kilometers in the sea, what you then do as an over distance approach to your training is that you want to be able to swim in excess of 3.8 kilometers in the pool. Uh, no stopping, you can touch the wall, you know, that's going to be fine, but Basically, you want to be able to cover the distance of your race and more in the swimming pool before you, uh, before race day. Um, you know, so it's obviously good to be able to swim that much. And also, I think the, the main thing is going to be that it gives, it, it gives the athlete a lot of confidence to know that if they, if they had to swim a little bit more, if on the day the, the conditions were a little bit more challenging or they happen to swim off the course, 
because they've already been able to do that distance and more during training, it's not something that they will then worry about. So they just need to get their heads on straight, take a couple of breaths, and then just uh, focus on the task at hand, and then you know they'll be able to finish up their swim. So um, linked to how uh, what I mentioned in the previous slide, where the kick is not super essential uh, for speed and swimming, uh, it, the upper body is. So a lot of you, if you have a look at any of the like say any of the really good swimmers, a lot of them have very well developed uh, upper bodies, especially around the shoulders. Um, a lot of the open water swimming speed and ability to get over waves and deal with uh, currents, a lot of that's driven by uh, your arms and the ability to to pull and be very effective with your with your arms with your arm catch. So these things are what we will then usually focus a little bit more on in training. You will do some work with uh, hand pedals just to build strength. Sometimes you do uh, a little bit more work with a pool boy. So just to, the pool boy helps to really lift up uh, the lower body, put the swimmers in a, a slightly better position, better for them to, to learn what an ideal position for swimming is. And really you just want to go to build um, that sort of strength uh, and muscular endurance into the upper body. So that when it comes to that transition to open water, they want to be able, you want to be able to vary your stroke rate. So uh, what I mean by uh, stroke rate is just uh, how many strokes they're taking uh, a minute. So um, in cycling, it's going to be uh, what the cadence is. So your cadence or your, your arm stroke. Usually when we transition to the open water, we want to be able to have a slightly higher arm uh, turnover. You want to be, uh, taking maybe slightly shorter strokes but at a higher stroke rate so that when the waves are coming and the water is not as uh, not as calm to swim in, it's easier to get over those little bumps and you're not uh, being hit by waves and it doesn't affect the, it doesn't affect your stroke as much. Um, and the last thing that we try and instill into um, our athletes and the, when we're coaching them in the pool is that they, they have to be adaptable. So a lot of whether or not the, the waves are going to be big or where the, the sun is coming from, you know, how, how big the current, or how strong the current, which way is it pulling, these things are out of our hands. Uh, so the only things that we can really rely on will be our uh, uh, fundamentals and a lot of the, the basics that we learn in the pool. So knowing that your stroke and your technique is solid, this allows you to make the adjustments when you're in the open water. So the things that you always focus on will be the catch right at the start of the stroke. Um, you want to be able to finish the stroke as much as you can towards the end of the, you want to push all the water backwards down past your leg as far as possible. But if need be, you know, we would shorten up the stroke a little bit, make it a little bit more choppy. Uh, we would have a faster so we would bring the arm up out of the water a little bit faster. So these small things that you change just to adapt to the conditions of the water uh, of the of the ocean during your race, but the things which are crucial to getting you speed, you know, those things don't ever change. All right, so some of the, the skills that are crucial to open water swimming will be cycling. So that's just making sure that you're not going off course. Uh, alternate breathing is uh, useful, especially if some of the uh, swim courses will are uh, going up one direction and they come back down the other. So if the waves are always coming from one side, if they're always coming from the right, and that happens to be the side that you breathe, you may find it difficult to get as much air into, uh, air in as you are when you're swimming. So it is useful to go to breathe on the other side. Um, drafting. Drafting is something which is that you always see like a, in a F1 races where the, the car behind is in the slipstream of the car in front. This is uh, amazingly helpful in swimming, uh, but it's also something that is more of an advanced skill. It's something that if you have um, a bit more training and you, are, you have the confidence to swim very close to another swimmer, if you swim on their hip, uh, just off to the side, or you swim at the feet, so just where they are kicking, you know, just where all the bubbles are, you can save you know, um, a significant amount of energy. And if you choose the right swimmer to follow, uh, assuming that they are going the right direction and they're taking the shortest line, it is uh, something that allows you to kind of go on autopilot and just switch off uh, for certain portions and just make sure that you're following the guy in front of you so you save some energy. You know, he's taking you around the course uh, a lot of time if it's, a, if it's a good swimmer. 
they will also clear the path through some other swimmers for you. So something that you definitely want to you try, you want to work towards being able to do if you have done a couple of races. Um, so and as I mentioned earlier, we want to make sure that all the athletes who participate, you know, whether make sure they can either tread water or they are confident in um, swimming a safety stroke like breaststroke. So, um, in a recent race um, in last year's Gisaru Half Ironman. Um, the race organizers did have these floating uh, pontoons halfway along the uh, swim course. It's not something that you see at a lot of races in general, but they were clearly marked as uh, being rest stops. Um, usually in open water races, you only get um, kayakers who are there for safety. Most of the time, they'll tell you that if you have to hang onto a kayak, they'll let you take a quick rest, but if you're there for a prolonged period of time, they will disqualify you from the swim. So, but some racers have introduced um, some stroking platforms where athletes can now jump on just to just to have a bit of a break. So, if you are ever in a race, you know if you if you have to use them, you know, don't don't be don't be uh, shy to use them. Everyone needs to take a break once in a while. All right. So, um, I think one of the danger zones um, that I would foresee that can be a problem for a lot of swimmers that that will lead to a, a uh, cases where they are more anxious than, than the rest of the swim would be when we're rounding uh, the turning boy. Um, this and the start, because right at the beginning, at the start of the race, you know, everyone is ready to go. You know, you've done all this training for months, and then now you're suddenly, everyone's rushing into the water. What happens is everyone uh, overestimates how fit they are, and you start sprinting in the water for the first 100 or 200 meters, and then suddenly, you know, your heart rate is through the roof, you know, finding it difficult to breathe. Um, if there are a lot of people around you, you know, or it's very easy to start to swallow water or you know, to miss a miss a breath or two. Um, so right at the start, and as well as you're trying to when you're trying to make uh, the turn around the swim course, these are the points where um, I think you can run into a bit of difficulty, especially if you are surrounded by some other swimmers. A lot of these turning boys are fairly large, but they're anchored uh, right at the bottom with a very thick nylon rope. So if you swim too close, if you're trying to take the shortest route possible, you know, just trying to get around, if you have a swimmer beside you, it is very easy to be pushed under uh, the turning boy or get an arm caught in the rope that is anchoring the, the boy in, in place. So a lot of times, if you are not there, if you're not racing for position, or if you are not um, very confident, um, my advice is always to take a slightly larger, take a slightly wider line as you're turning, as you're going around the, the if you're, as you're making the turn, you're going to give up, you know, it's a couple of seconds, it's not going to make a, a, a huge deal, um, especially if the trade-off is that you have some clear water to swim around, you don't have to dodge any legs or any flying elbows, you know, so, um, you don't want to put yourself in a position where you could get in trouble. All right, so one of the things that we want to do to prepare, you know, is going to be to really get the mind right. And so um, I, I read Dune recently, and so that, that's one of the reason why uh, I, came, I came across this quote. And so it's true that fear is the mind killer. And so if you are worried right from the beginning, uh, it puts you in a really bad um, uh, mental state to start a race, especially a race which you, which um, could potentially go for quite a few hours. You want to be in a good hit space right before you start. Right, so with a uh, with a lot of your training for a triathlon, you know. So one of the things that I'm trying to uh, encourage a lot of the athletes that I coach and uh, just anyone who is doing triathlon is to actually be a bit more proactive before swimming. Um, the swimming portion of the race shouldn't be something that you are trying to uh, simply get through uh, without incident so that you can get onto the bike. So the, the swim is um, it's a, a crucial part for you to get a good start. You know, it, I think it really sets the tone for the rest of your race. And just from a, from a safety perspective, you know, the, the, as you've seen from a lot of the, the research and just the, the incidents that we've seen, you know, the, the chances of uh, any fatalities happen you know, for if it happening the swim is much greater than on the bike or on the run. And so it's not something that we are it's not something that you are um, you just wanna be 
you don't want to be prepared just enough for the swim, like I would suggest that you definitely put in as much as many hours as you can. You know, if you if it means sacrificing perhaps you know one of your runs during the week, you know it's going to be worth doing just to know that just to have the peace of mind and have the confidence to go into uh, uh, a race, knowing that the swim is not going to be a liability and it's not going to be something that you are constantly worried about uh, just as you are going to head into your race. Okay, so um, as you mentioned before, you know, swimming on its own is not doesn't come naturally to, to any of us. Uh, takes a lot of practice. If you are not an experienced swimmer, you lose, you lose the feel for the water very quickly. Uh, you would have to be in the pool two, three, four times a week, you know, especially right at the start. I think you need to, you need to, be, you need to sort of be, uh, you need to overdo it a little bit at the beginning just to make sure that um, swimming, you're not, you don't have a, a real like a, a first reaction to swimming. A lot of people just don't like to swim because it's, it's challenging. But if you are serious about uh, triathlon, uh, you're serious about your own safety, especially when it comes to, to these races, I think it's worth the, it's worth a bit more uh, trouble at the beginning to spend the extra time in the pool, you know, engage a coach to look at your technique. Uh, I think that's very important for people who have very little experience swimming. It's something to, um, having somebody else there to, to guide you uh, along makes a, a huge difference. Okay, so the uh, as mentioned before, one of the huge, one of the biggest uh, differences between race day and training is just that when it comes to the race, you're suddenly surrounded by hundreds of other athletes. And while we can't get that amount of people into to training, what you can do is that if you have if you do train as a group, um, what you want to do is encourage everyone to swim together. If you all go, if you have a race coming up, get everybody to go to a, a public pool together. Uh, cram as many people as you can into uh, one of the roped up swimming lanes and you know you just start maybe three or four people squash in the lane and you just swim learn to swim up and down the pool learn to learn to see what it feels like to be bumped a little bit you know have to have to let maybe someone go ahead or you wanna what you need to do if someone sort of suddenly pushes you down a hip these are things which um, they may seem to not be very useful while you're training because it's all it feels so uh, feels so simulated. It's maybe just trying to act out a scenario. But if you have a little bit of experience, uh, at least with what it might feel like, it really takes a uh, takes a mental load off. Um, if you happen to have to encounter any of these situations uh, during uh, during the races, you know, so just being in the water a lot more. This really helps you to feel uh, a lot more, a lot more comfortable. You just want to a lot of it is just being uh, familiar with your surroundings. And if if being in the ocean is not something that you are used to, you know, so the simple thing we can do to to um, tackle that is to just you know just go to the beach a little bit more, you know, spend a bit more time, just swim a little bit there, and um, it really pays off uh, in the end when you when it comes to the race. All right, so uh, just one last thing we wanna touch on is uh, having a, a pre-swim or pre-race routine. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, if you if a race that you're going to do is a wetsuit legal race, you want to get this wetsuit way ahead of time. Um, or if you're choosing to wear a swim skin, a uh, swim skin is something that triathletes will wear over their race suit. And because of the hydrophobic uh, material that it used on the swim skin, uh, it allows you to swim a lot faster. So, but these, uh, the swim skin and the wetsuit are very, very restrictive. Uh, they can be very tight. So if you plan to, to use one, you want to get it early, uh, spend a lot of time in it, spend a lot of time in, it, in the pool as well, or even in, uh, in the ocean, if you can get a chance to use it and just get used to the feel of it and uh, how it, what it feels like to, to swim in it and spend an extended amount of time in it uh, on the day of your race or prior to it, or leading up to the race, and on race day itself, you really want to get to the race site a little bit earlier. You know, have a look at the conditions. Um, if you can see uh, where, which direction is the swell coming from. Um, so um, learn where the race course is, because even though you from land, you can sort of see that the, the race course is pretty clearly marked out. 
once you're in the water, uh, everything becomes a little bit more challenging for you. So just have, have an idea of where you're going so that in the event that you are surrounded by a lot of people or you're left alone, you know, and if you just pop your head up, you, you know where to go on your own. It's not one thing you're going to worry about, you know, whether or not you are swimming off course, you know, just, just, just prepare and spend a little bit more, um, spend a little bit more effort getting yourself ready for, uh, for the race itself. Um, this applies to all levels of athletes, you know, whether you are very experienced or whether you are um, a newbie and you are not there to go for any specific timing, it, it pays to be prepared. Um, so if you can, before the race, try and get into the water. Not all races allow it. Some of them you may have to sort of sneak in uh, into the water. So, but if you can, I would advise you to get into the water maybe five or 10 minutes before you start or as, as early as you can. Um, just spend some time in the water, get used to the conditions, get used to um, the temperature of the water, especially. Um, and then just uh, spend some time, you know, maybe even just swimming or walking out, knowing how deep the, the in, initial period is, uh, the initial um, uh, beach run in is. You find that once you can get over that first minute or two in the water, uh, your nerves usually will come down. And uh, you get into you sort of the switch in your head sort of goes on, and you get into this mode where you are. Uh, it all comes back down to your muscle memory, all the things that you've done in training. You just fall back on, on that, and then usually that's going to be enough to to get you through uh, the rest of your swim, and then uh, you know get you off to a good start for the rest of your race. All right, so uh, that's going to be uh, my portion for for this part of the. Um, the discussion today. Uh, I guess any questions Joshua will, will have at the end. Yes. Thank you so it, much, so, Willie, uh, for the tips. No problem. Yes. Thanks again, Willie. Again, I apologize for my camera uh, malfunction. Um, last but certainly not the least, uh, I would like to invite uh, Monsieur Hui Kun. Uh, Hui Kun is our very own honorary treasurer of SMAS. Uh, as she's getting ready, please allow me to introduce her. So Hui Kun is a sport and exercise physiotherapist with more than 10 years of experience with elite athletes. She has worked with numerous athletes, including the Singapore National Swimming and Para Swimming teams. She has also provided medical support for Team Singapore at various major games and both local and international tournaments. Her forte is in sport-specific injury management and rehabilitation, developing injury prevention strategies and pitch site management. She is currently an adjunct lecturer and works part-time in private practice. Without further ado, please allow me to introduce Hui Kun. Hui Kun, please. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, spending some time this afternoon on uh, talking about uh, open water swimming. Um, Okay, so my my experience with uh, uh, open water swimming was just because of um, one of our national athletes, uh, which is I can tell you that was um, during uh, my thing with the national swimming team, that she was one of the swimmers in the national uh, training center, and that uh, at that time she was uh, trying to qualify for uh, the open water swimming uh, in Olympics. So uh, most of my time that I worked with her was actually within the uh, AQC, uh, the uh, aquatic center itself. Um, and that it was only when she qualified for Olympics, that's where you know, I would um, be activated to actually uh, work with her um, during her, her swimming event itself. Okay, so um, I think, um, um, and, other than that, there were a couple of professional uh, athletes uh, that who comes into uh, SSI previously to sort out their injury. So what I'm going to share about is, is that I think other than um, uh, um, sudden cardiac death or sudden cardiac arrest, uh, what are some of the other issues that uh, you know uh, our open water swimmers or our triathletes will face? Uh, in during their open water swimming event itself. Okay, so um, some of these issues would be, uh, one, which is that when it comes to open water swimming, uh, 
we are talking about that it's a swimming event that happens outside the swimming pool. So it can be a lake, river, sea, or ocean. And that uh, with the open water medicine uh, pair itself, we are talking about that, you know, uh, we look at open water swimming while it's alone and also serve life uh, saving uh, events. And next thing is that we need to know that, the, you know, for all water, um, open water distance uh, swimming, you, you know, it is long distance, ranging from 5, 10, to 5 meters. So uh, it's usually uh, quite a long event, and that, uh, you know, some of the times uh, where you are on site, uh, what are some of the issues that we will face or some of the issues that our athletes will face. Okay, this is based on uh, uh, actually a poster presentation that uh, was uh, presented during one of the injury prevention conference. Um, it's done by uh, some European uh, 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 medical team. So they had collected uh, data on four uh, open water races and seven triathlon um, events with about 60,000 participants. So out of that, actually, there are, um, they reported that um, there were 490 students that required inspection uh, from water rescue team. So which means that um, they needed, the students needed, or the athletes needed help in the water itself, which um, it takes up to about 11%. That requires extraction. So what it means is that couldn't continue that race anymore and they need to be taken out of, of, of the water. So within the seven triathlon events itself, there were uh, 818 that required inspection during swim lake, and that uh, that takes up about 28%. Uh, no, so, sorry, 28% require extraction, um, which I think is actually quite a, a, a high number. Okay, And then the reason for some of the reported extraction was that uh, fatigue, uh, there were breathing difficulties, especially there was in the open water swimming event. Uh, cramps was another complaint, uh, and that uh, there were a small amount that was due to injury. And that uh, within this data collection phase itself, there were two cases of cardiac arrest. Okay, so the other thing about uh, covering for open water swimming is that uh, what are some of the considerations? So uh, a few things that we need to consider about is the natu natural hazard, um, environment hazard, uh, microbial quality, your uh, cyanobacteria quality hazard, uh, uh, wildlife, hazardous wildlife, chemical quality, and aesthetic quality. So the natural hazard would be things like uh, the, the landscape of the competition event itself, you know, the current, the dips, um, the water rates, etc., which actually can affect a few things uh, that uh, uh, affect your swimming uh, itself. Environmental hazard with the temperature, so uh, too hot, too cold, is, uh, is one of the issues. The other one is a lot of exposure to uh, UV rays um, that could also pose a, a, a health effects on swimmers. And of course, in open water itself, uh, being in the lake, river, or even open sea, um, there are one life uh, uh, um, creatures that are living within the, the, uh, the water itself. There's also things like pollution, littering, which also uh, predispose uh, various types of virus, bacteria that are out in the water itself that can affect. Uh, our swimmers or our athletes, uh, especially in uh, prolonged swimming in the water itself. So, some uh, uh, bacterial quality, these are what uh, they call the uh, blue, uh, blue black algae. So, it is actually a form of algae. Um, with a small, small amount of it, I don't think that's actually uh, anything uh, uh, alarming for, for our health, but uh, the concern is that bacteria that that is uh, overgrown of this bacteria or algae itself, uh, it can actually become toxic. Such toxic 
的总是司机是的，是的，是的，司机啊，我们的。Other. Sorry, apologies, we couldn't. I think we'll be losing you on the microphone. Okay. All right. Is yes. that uh, uh, yes. better? Better, okay. better. That's better. Thanks. Okay. So the other uh one is is uh, uh hazardous wildlife. Uh, so we have things like uh the most common one is uh uh stingray, um jellyfish, and then um uh, at times we may have sharks or crocodile kind of uh, thing in, in certain uh, terrain um, of the, the, the water. Uh, last, the last two chemical qualities would be, we're talking about um, you know, chemical waste, uh, pollution, uh, littering, and also things like oil pollution that's actually, uh, that can potentially uh, lead to health concern within our ethics itself. Um, Aesthetic qualities, basically, it is looking, we're talking about the clarity of the water. So, um, it is important to be, for the water to be as clear as possible so that, um, you know, the swimmers could be, could, are uh, able to identify obstacle, uh, within the, the water itself and also, um, uh, understand and, and get an indication about the water depth. Okay, so these are some of the considerations. So while I was, uh, you know, trying to prepare for, for the Olympic coverage, uh, this uh, this article uh, uh, came out and they actually talk a little bit about um, the cold water immersion. So what it, uh, they, they are cautioning um, open water swimmer is that um, the physiological, uh, physiological changes during a cold water immersion um, where you know you have the initial immersion between three to, uh, uh, within the first three minutes, there is the skin cooling that occurs and it can trigger a cold shock response. So the the, the this article actually caution says that um, there could be uh, because of the sudden change in uh, the temperature during the uh, 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 the water entry, there is actually a potential of uh, uh, a cold shock response that could be quite fatal at the early stage of the, the swim event itself. So subsequently, when you are in water uh, for slightly longer, there is the neuromuscular cooling followed by heat core temperature uh, uh, drop um, that could lead to near hypothermia. Okay, the last stage itself is actually the, the calm rescue collapse where uh, basically, they enter. Uh, they, the the swimmers, if they go, it is too cold that they go down into hypothermia. And during that rescue stage, if the um, changes are just too rapid, then there is actually a after drop phenomenon. Okay, so what are some of the medical issues in water open water swimming itself? Um, I think for medical concern, uh, three big areas. So cardiorespiratory infection and also the human factor. So what uh, uh, for cardiorespiratory, usually it is actually about concerning about not just about cardiac arrest, but it is about um, issues like hypertermia or hyperthermia uh, resulting in um, thermal uh, irregulation or maladaptation. And that would actually predispose uh, uh, the athlete to go into a cardio uh, 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 issues. And also, on the other hand, we're talking about uh, things like there could be also uh, potential of um, issues like um, um, exercise due uh, bronchial constriction, etc. Okay. So some of these uh, are other, besides the hypotonia and hypertonia, um, some of the cases that were reported was also the swimming-induced uh, pulmonary edema. Okay. Um, as for infection-wise, I think the biggest uh, concern, and it's quite a common uh, thing that we see in uh, some of the uh, open water swimmers, is uh, actually the gastroenteritis infection. Okay, this is due to that. Um, during that prolonged uh, for, uh, water immersion, 
uh, with their swim and their breathing, it is uh, inevitable that um, you know water gets into their mouth and that they may uh, swallow uh, some of the uh, water. And if there are bacteria and uh, a virus or um, some other microorganism uh, that are, are in within in the water itself, that may actually uh, result in quite a bit of a gastro uh, upset. Okay, the other type of infection would be things like um, ear infection. Um, the one the article is suggesting that some of this um, ear infection was due to uh, fecal uh, uh, content that are found in water and that it actually gets into the ear. It actually uh, would um, result in some form of uh, uh, ear infection. Uh, the next one is actually uh, infection of the skin or skin uh, irritation, and this I basically due to dirt, um, uh, microorganism, and um, at times uh, uh, other bacteria um, that and with the prolonged immersion in water, it just uh, dampens your uh, uh, skin condition itself. So um, the next one for human factors, uh, the one of the uh, concern is actually the body type. So um, the difference between the competitive swimmers and the um, uh, um, open water swimmers is that the water, open water swimmers tends to be thinner. They are, tend to be smaller and uh, they are not as muscular as um, the competitive swimmer. Um, however, with that thinness, uh, a concern is that the decrease in potential uh, uh, percent, uh, fat percentage actually leads to uh, risk of hypothermia. Okay. Uh, as for the age wise, uh, the it's the opposite of competitive swimmers where uh, we are look, we are concerned uh, where you know the uh, shorter sprint distance you know you get the younger stronger ones uh, doing very well. Uh, as for you know the distance swimming itself, we tend to have the more senior and the older age group. Uh, with that. What is suggesting that because of that challenging terrain, you um, for open water swimming you usually need uh, swimmers that are more experienced. So for younger swimmers, they definitely need uh, a lot more uh, supervision and a lot more guidance. Um, diet and hydration could be a uh, effect. Uh, 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 one of the consideration um, in terms of uh, affecting their health uh, and their training. Um, the other issues would be things like um, uh, overtraining, uh, rest, uh, their inadequate rest and recovery, and also their, uh, how well they train and their fitness status. Now, lastly, what um, the, con the other concern would be more of a musculoskeletal issues in, uh, within the open water swimming itself. I basically classify it within it, uh, whether it is an acute issue or it is actually a repetitive stress uh, 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 component. Okay, so for acute muscular, uh, acute issues, there would be things like your contact and your non-contact uh, 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 component. For contact would be that during a race where you, uh, where you have many um, swimmers uh, swimming within a uh, 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 constrained space itself, um, there may be uh, an with that competitive um, in, in terms of speeds and trying to get uh, within a, a ideal uh, positioning, uh, what you could end up with is that there could be um, swimming, swimmers colliding with each other and that during this stage uh, with a collision um, or you know, there could be issues like uh, uh, confusion and uh, bruises. Um, there can be also issue with laceration that's coming from um, cuts from, you know, uh, uh, whether it's from the equipment such as uh, goggles, uh, hand, legs. Some of them can get untang uh, entangled with each other. Um, it's not uh, uncommon to see that there could be issues of dislocation, uh, joint sprain, and also the cases of choking. Uh, as for non-contact, usually it comes from uh, issue with abrasion, contusion, and choking. So abrasion are usually 
um, the frictioning between their attire or their equipment such as goggles in their skin. Um, and this happens usually on a more longer distance where they are immersing in water for a longer period of time. Okay. Um, for repetitive stress um, start, uh, kind of um, problem, it's usually issues with uh, most common ones are shoulder pain. Um, the difference between open water swimmer and um, that um, 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 competitive swimmer is that I think they, other than a uh, shoulder pain, they usually also have issues uh, coming from a uh, cervical spine or uh, uh, thoracic spine uh, issues. Okay, um, my explanation on, on this is that uh, for the competitive swimmers, uh, basically when they enter water in the pool, they go into a very streamlined position. Okay, and they rely on the lines at the bottom of the pool to guide them in terms of direction. So they just need to, you know, have a good uh, core control, put themselves in a, a, a very streamlined position, and they could most probably even, uh, you know, pull themselves forward. Um, but for open water swimming itself, you know, sometimes they may not uh, have any um, uh, uh, guidance in terms of direction. So their sighting is actually very important, which a lot of times they would need to look up uh, within uh, out of the water to actually get a sense of their direction. So um, with that, a lot of time, um, you know, there would be the, the requirement of a spiral and thoracic spine extension range uh, needs to be there. So um, for them, they have a few issues. So if the pain comes from water entry, um, usually it is likely because of uh, the usual anterior shoulder impingement. However, if their complaints of their shoulder pain is coming from a recovery phase, um, then you know a lot of time we have to actually look into um, their cervical spine and the thoracic spine mobility just to actually ensure that they do have a good uh, ex uh, uh, extension of their thoracic and their cervical spine. Uh, once in a while, they do get their lumbar spine uh, 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 issues, but usually these are more uh, you more contributed during their dry land training, and then um, of course there is the uh, the cramps, the usual cramps that's coming from the legs or the abdominal. So with that, um, I think uh, one thing about uh, uh, injury prevention uh, uh, is that um, we kind of like um, encourage them to have progressive training. So, um, you know, ensure that they, they manage their load um, and their training intensity appropriately. Um, sort out their technical issues, um, like their swimming uh, techniques and their strokes. Um, on the other hand, it's, it's important to actually uh, look at what events that they're going and have enough environmental acclimatization. Uh, in Singapore, according to all the uh, 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 marathon swimmers or the long distance swimmers, a very big challenge is that it is logistically, financially very challenging to actually go into open water uh, training within Singapore itself. So um, the exposure is actually quite limited. Um, so it is actually very important where we actually advise them to look into how are they going to you know, expose themselves adequately in terms of the build up to uh, their major events. Um, the other one is, is actually, um, you know, uh, having a sense of whether, what kind of terrain that they're racing in, um, whether it is a lake, river versus a sea or ocean. Um, other things that could actually help them or uh, we keep a lookout on is, is, that, uh, on is the ensuring that they have enough sunscreen. Um, you know, wear the appropriate um, swimming costume or the, the comb suit uh, for the appropriate water temperature. Um, some of the dietitian may also suggest that they um, take a routine, uh, build up um, some probiotics prior to that event, and then also ensure hydration and nutrition and that we give them, you know, we will engage them in um, all that safety awareness. 
so um, with that, that's my end of my presentation. Um, and thank you for spending time with us here. Yep.